My name is Sunitha and I'm from Regularize. On behalf of Regularize, I would like to thank everyone for joining us on this their Saturday afternoon to intend the, this webinar on undocumented migrants and human rights. I am also grateful to our panelists for coming, committing their time to being here and speaking about such an important topic. In the recent months, in spite of the pandemic, the political climate has been one where anti-migrant narratives have been commonplace across Europe yet again. This webinar is part of a weekend of action that has been called for by migrants organised with involvement from many migrant rights groups and community action groups across the UK. The actions will conclude with a vigil on Monday the 12th of October to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the death of Jimmy Mabenga. So um, before I start, I just want to like share with you the agenda for today. So we'll start with um, terminology from Professor Bridget Anderson um, and moving on to uh, some conversations from Movimento Migrante Napoli from Italy and then having some people who have lived experiences speak about um, what their uh, own experiences of the hostile environment and how it's impacted their lives and then we'll go on to a QA and a at five o'clock. Please put any questions um, for your Q&A in the chat. So um, for those who don't know about him, I just want to tell you a bit about Jimmy Mabenga. Jimmy Mabenga was a husband to Adrian Makenda Kambana. Jimmy Mabenga was a father to five children, four sons, Roland, Kevin, Akram and Jordan and one daughter, Blessing. Jimmy Mabenga was an Angolan man who came to the UK in 1994 and spent those 16 years of his life from the age of 30 calling the UK his home. Jimmy Mabenga was a human being just like you and I. On the 12th of October, he was on a British Airways flight with his final destination being Angola as he's being deported from the UK. On this flight, he spoke to his wife on the phone and was understandably emotional, given that he was being separated from his family in the UK. Not long after this, he was violently restrained by three G4S guards on this flight. He was overheard by a passenger on this flight saying the phrase, I can't breathe. The excessive force inevitably led to his death, age 46, at the hands of the G4S guards. His death was preventable. It should never have happened. Though he had served two years in prison for a conviction in 2006, when he was applying for permanent residency, a decision was made to deport him. He was being doubly punished after serving his sentence and spending his conviction by now being deported away from his wife and children. As if this wasn't cruel enough, ultimately his mistreatment led to his death. Mistreatment that happened simply for being black and being born outside the UK. His family did not get justice as the private security guards employed by G4S were found not guilty of manslaughter of Jimmy Mabenga. Two of them were found to have racist and anti-migrant text on their phones, though this was not deemed relevant to the trial. In the 10 years since, the hostile environment has become a staple of the British landscape. Nowadays, instead of deportations and enforced removals happening on commercial flights, they happen on charter flights, often in the dead of night. Unfortunately, 
deaths as a result of the policies of this government did not end with Jimmy Mbenga. Last year, there was the Essex 39, where 39 Vietnamese migrants, including 10 teenagers, were found dead in the back of a lorry in Grays, Essex. If they had made it alive, they would almost certainly have been undocumented themselves. More recently, in August of this year, there was the death of Mercy Baguma, whose body was found in Glasgow with her malnourished baby beside her. She had been made destitute due to losing her job after her right to remain expired, showing just how precarious an existence it can be as a migrant in the UK and how easily one can be made undocumented. So I want you to tell you a bit about Regularize. We are a migrant founded grassroots collective made up of migrants, British citizens and allies. Our focus is on solidarity by ensuring that we amplify the voices and needs of undocumented migrants. We are centered around and informed by those with lived experience. The primary goal of our campaign is to obtain leave to remain and a safer and a more equitable path to settlement and citizenship for all undocumented migrants and migrants with insecure status already living in the UK. Regular Rise are part of a status of a part of Status Now network, which is a national network of 80 plus autonomous organizations which come together. The network as status, as um, uh, regularized do as well, call for status or leave to remain to be granted to all undocumented migrants and migrants with insecure status, including those in the legal process. This has arisen as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and Status Now's campaign is Status Now for All and Health and Safety for All. So I want to speak about the impact of regularization and what the realities are for undocumented migrants and migrants with insecure status. They face several challenges and hardships, which are not limited to, but include the following. Lack of access to healthcare. In one case, a man known as Elvis died in his home in April due to COVID-19. He feared both the potential costs and being reported, detained or removed because of being undocumented due to the NHS carrying out immigration checks. Even though the government has spent, suspended these checks for COVID-19, many undocumented migrants and those with insecure status are untrust, untrustworthy of this line given the policies of the hostile environment. Let's also not forget Simba, who was presented with a hefty bill of £93,000 after receiving treatment for a stroke. Restrictive access to housing. In the context of the pandemic, this means that they risk overcrowded living conditions, making it impossible to physically distance. As we know, the pandemic also disproportionately affects Black and Asian and migrant groups with there also being higher rates of deaths amongst these communities. Migrants are at risk of being um, exploited and discriminated by employers, sexual predators, landlords, and others. And they live in constant fear of being detained or deported. Though it is difficult to know the exact number of undocumented migrants in the UK, due to the invisible nature of living this way, a regularization scheme like this would improve the lives of an um, estimated 800,000 to 1.2 million people, including 215,000 children, half who were born in the UK, who currently do not have fundamental rights. The idea of settlement and citizenship is important as most people who end up undocumented would have had a visa at some point and would have fallen through the cracks of the immigration system for any number of reasons. 
including, as mentioned in the example of Mercy Baguma, her visa expiring. A similar scheme to the EU migrant settlement would provide some security currently denied by so many. With the regularization scheme, undocumented migrants and migrants with insecure status would be granted fundamental human rights. It would allow them to be able to live with dignity and to part participate in society fully. As a collective, regularized believe firmly in an, an inclusive space without hierarchies amongst migrant groups. We fundamentally reject the narratives around worthy, deserving or unworthy, undeserving migrants. We avoid language that dehumanizes migrants, particularly those often used in the media and by some governments such as illegal. No human is illegal. Our conversations focus on equity for all. We act in solidarity, going beyond lip service or performative actions. As with other crises of the past, the government is trying to scapegoat those that have been made most vulnerable by its policies, which includes migrants and those seeking asylum, for the economic woes caused by years of its own oversight and mismanagement. History has taught us that language that dehumanizes any group of human beings is dangerous. We can all play our part in changing people's opinions. We must have these discussions with people, calling out those that refer to migrants as illegal and challenging the narratives that ignore how wars and conflict make people vulnerable and how the UK's hostile environment policies do that all over again. Now I'm going to pass it on to Bridget. Um, Bridget is a professor of migration, mobilities and citizenship at the School of Sociology politics and international studies at the director and the director of migration mobilities at the University of Bristol in the UK. She's an unparalleled expert researcher. Her work explores the tension between labor market flexibilities and citizenship rights and pioneered an understanding of the functions of immigration in key labor market sectors. Her interest in labour demand has meant an engagement with debates about trafficking and modern day slavery, which in turn led to an interest in state enforcement and deportation, and in the ways immigration controls increasingly impact on citizens as well as on migrants. Bridget has worked closely with migrants, organisations, trade unions and legal practitioners at local, national and international levels. She has written important books like Us and Them, The Dangerous Politics of Immigration Control, which ought to be on the desks of every activist, politician, trade unionist, charity, civil servant, teacher, doctor, and anyone else's desks. She also authored Doing the Dirty Work, The Politics, The Global Politics of Domestic Labour. Bridget will be helping us contextualize and understand key terminology and functions of immigration as well as the effects of immigration controls from a socio-historical and socio-political perspective. Without further ado, I want to pass it on to Bridget Anderson. Thanks, Anita. Can you hear me? Am yeah. I good? Great. Thank you for your very generous, um, for your very generous introduction, and thanks for having me. It's a real privilege to be here uh, talking to people. Um, and I think your kind of opening words were. You know, they, they reminded us of the violence that is, that is experienced by so many migrants and also of the importance of thinking about race and racism. So, you know, um, uh, Sunita talked about COVID-19 and how that's given the kind of impetus to um, uh, the regularise group. And, but it's also clear that Black Lives Matter has also uh, influenced the political debate. And let's hope that it carries on influencing that debate and shaping our actions so that we are no longer in the disgusting position of having people die saying, I can't breathe while official state, officials of the state are actually um, killing people. 
So um, I want to talk a little bit about, migra about migrants and terminology because I do think that the question of who is a migrant is something that um, a lot of the public find very difficult to grapple with. So in so many ways, there's such a kind of conversation about what a problem migration is um, and what, you know, what problems migrants pose. But actually, when you ask people who they think they're talking about when they're talking about migrants, it's actually very unclear. And that goes, even if you're looking at people that gather data, so even if you're who would tend to be very sort of particular about the words that they use and the definitions that they use, Sometimes data gatherers mean people who are born abroad. Sometimes they mean foreign nationals. Sometimes they mean people who are planning to come to a country for, a, for, for 12 months or more. So there's very different ideas about who counts as a migrant. But I suppose maybe for us, the bottom line is to remember that migrants are made, not born, and they're made in large part through immigration controls, through immigration controls that can illegalize people, that can tie them to their employer, that can say how many hours they are or are not allowed to work, that can tie you to a spouse, um, that can say how long you're legally allowed to reside in a country and so on. So uh, migrants are made through immigration and asylum and citizenship laws. But migrants are also made in the public imagination and in the media. And in fact, not all people born abroad, not all foreign nationals, not all people who are subject to immigration controls are imagined as migrants. Prince Philip, after all, was born abroad, but most people wouldn't think he was a migrant, even if he counts as a migrant in the data set. Uh, a US banker in London probably is not imagined as a migrant, particularly if they're white, whereas the woman cleaning their house could easily be imagined as a migrant, particularly if she's black. So there's certain assumptions that I think that are brought to the public conversation about who counts as a migrant. And putting it at its most crude, the migrant is imagined as a poor person, and the migrant is imagined as a black or a brown person. Wealthy white British people who live abroad are not migrants, they're expats or they're cosmopolitans or they're backpackers or they're a whole host of other things, but they're not imagined as migrants. In fact, so racialized is our idea of a migrant that um, we can even have so-called second and third generation migrants who haven't even crossed the border in their lives. So there is something important about race going on here, which isn't to say that migrants can't also be white people. And we saw this with EU migration and EU mobility, where in fact there came to be a sort of big debate about, or not debate, how suddenly it was, um, it seemed that uh, people were able to say, oh, it's not racist to say that you don't like immigration anymore, because actually now we're talking about white people and we don't like white migrants. And so that means that we're not talking about race and that it's not racist to say that you don't like immigration. I mean, that's sort of, that's putting it in a crude way, but I think that was kind of like some of the underpinning assumptions about it. But actually, not racist to talk about immigration, but, but in fact, still talking about race, only now talking about whiteness and a sort of whiteness like Irish people and Jewish people in former times, not an invisible whiteness, a whiteness that you can see when people talk about the white working class. It's when middle, whiteness becomes invisible when we're talking about middle class people but not when we're talking about people who are imagined as being poor, somehow not the same kind of type of person as kind of policymaker types. So I think there's something important here about to think about race, about whiteness, about whiteness that isn't proper whiteness and around migration. So, the, so kind of to put it in a nutshell, a migrant is imagined as a poor person 
a person of color or a person who's white but not properly white like middle class people. Um, Migrant, what does that mean? Well, it means not only is it legal to discriminate, oh, sorry, to discriminate against you, but actually it is a discrimination that in many ways is required by law. So for example, if you've got, a, if you've got citizenship, an employer isn't allowed to say, you can't come and work for me because you were born in the wrong country. But if you're a migrant worker, an employer is obliged to they can't find somebody from the EU, the EEA, and soon it will only be the UK um, in, uh, first before they employ you. So there is a way in which, although the word discrimination isn't used, it's actually obliged in law if you're a migrant worker. It also means potentially that you've got no recourse to public funds, including access to uh, uh, basic health care, to the welfare state, as the talked about in the introduction and actually I think this is really important when we're thinking about COVID and the impact of COVID so we saw um, you know the, the data tell us that um, black and minority ethnic people are disproportionately affected by COVID but it's actually quite difficult to get data on the impact on migrants how many migrants were actually continuing to work because they didn't have access to public funds because they weren't able to go on universal credit. What sorts of pressure were being put on people to carry on working despite the fact that it wasn't safe? So although it's difficult for migrants to access the welfare state, I think it's really important that we remember where the money came and comes from to make the welfare state. The money behind the welfare state, the money when, when the NHS was founded came from the colonies. It came from people who were bled dry. It came from people who were taxed. It came from the plundering of natural resources, whether we're talking about rubber companies in Malaysia or oil companies in Iran. This is, the, this is why the, the welfare state is not an, uh, a national patrimony, but is something that needs to be shared by all. And we have to be clear that migrants have a right to access welfare benefits. Being a migrant can also mean that you're an essential worker, but also a disposable worker. Again, we saw this with COVID. We saw, yes, people being clapped and um, recognized, but actually still low waged, still working in very difficult conditions, in conditions that made life, that were, that were sometimes life threatening. Being a migrant means you're victimized by the hostile environment. Again, in the ways that Sunita talked about, the paper checking, the bullying, the harassment, the extortion, the sexual abuse. Being a migrant can mean that you're not viewed just like as a regular person, but, all, but that you're viewed as somehow um, poor, badly educated, not able to contribute, not actually able to share your talents. And some of this is also true of citizens, as we saw with the Windrush cases. And in a way, I think the Windrush cases show the importance of solidarity between migrants and citizens, between recognising that actually there are important common interests here. And let's remember that some so-called migrants, some foreign um, uh, wealthy foreign nationals can buy citizenship. So um, there's a law company called Henley and Partners, which um, it's worth looking, looking them up. You can see they produce every year a list of citizenships and how many countries you can travel if you have what citizenship. And it sort of puts, it ranks them in order. I can't remember what the top might be Finland at the moment. And the bottom is um, Afghanistan, Somalia, uh, Iraq. So there's a, there's a kind of gradation of citizenships and some people can buy it. So there's something here about wealth and its relation to citizenship. So what does it mean to, what's this telling us? Well, it's telling us that key to citizenship is being able to control your own movement and some people have more control than others. So I think we need to think about the right of control of our own movement, whether that's the right to stay at home and work from home if it's not state 
safe or travel abroad and go and work abroad. And the reason that I've put this picture of Frederick Douglass up um, is because I think he's inspirational in this. So Frederick Douglass was born into slavery. He escaped and he became a famous campaigner against the slave trade. And he fled to England and then got stuck because he was denied a passport on the basis that he wasn't a US citizen. And so when he was protesting this um, refusal to give him a passport, he wrote in a letter to a friend, and I'm gonna quote, I'm gonna end by these quotes. He said, you hold, and so do I, the image of our common gods ought to be a passport over all the habitable world. But others have ordained otherwise. They usurp authority over you and decide for you under what conditions you should travel. They say, you shall have a passport or you shall be put in prison. He also called for what he called the right of locomotion the right of migration, the right which belongs to no particular race, but, longs al but belongs alike to all and to all alike. So that's Frederick Douglass, famous campaigner against the slave trade. And I suppose we should see these sorts of activities as part of a long tradition of activism and organizing for the rights of free movement and an end to exploitation and racism. And recognize that the hostile environment is bad for everyone, because we're all living in the same environment. So it's not, it's not only about solidarity, but about our common interest in ending it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bridget. Really appreciate everything you've said. And thank you for giving your time again for um, to, to talk to us about all these important issues. Um, so we were meant to have Mariemma Fay speak, but she's been uh, called away. So I'm just going to ask if it's okay if Marissa Begonia speaks. Um, so just to let you know a bit about Marissa. Marissa moved to the UK from the Philippines via Singapore and Hong Kong as a migrant worker. She is a domestic worker and director and founding member of the Voice of Domestic Workers in the UK. She is a committed campaigner for justice and rights for Britain's 16,000 strong migrant workers. She is also a community organiser that helps domestic workers flee from abusive families and employers to find safety, abuse that is made more pervasive due to the increasingly restrictive immigration laws in the UK. So over to Marissa. Yeah, thank I Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. I think I'm going to switch off my video because it's distracting. I think my camera is not working properly. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, there are around 19,000 overseas domestic worker visas issued each year. These visas are issued to domestic workers entering the UK from outside of the EU to accompany an existing employer. Uh, sorry, I, I did turn it off because the video, I, the camera is not working properly. Yeah, is that okay? Uh, yeah, you see, it's like, uh, yeah, so I just continue and off the video. Yeah, sorry about that. So, yeah, so the hidden and unregulated nature of domestic work in a private household combined by the worker's status as a migrant in dependence on the employer for work, immigration status, accommodation, and information about the UK means that workers in this visa are especially vulnerable to abuse. In 2012, the government introduced restrictions which removed the rights of holders of the overseas domestic worker visa to change employer and renew the visa. Instead, workers entered on a six month long non-renewable on on which domestic workers are not permitted to change employer, no matter the reason. As expected, reported conditions of employment worsened. 
Migrant domestic workers are tied to a, vis uh, to a system that facilitates abuse and undermines their stated commitment to end slavery. Losing their visa after six months automatically deny domestic workers access to employment rights and tribunal court. Many domestic workers are now driven underground as many employers enslave, abuse, and exploit migrant domestic workers because the current system allows these perpetrators to do so. The Immigration Act 2016 further exposed workers to harm by introducing a criminal offense for undocumented working. This meant that undocumented workers who reported abuse to authorities might face a prison sentence and deportation. Isolated and unprotected undocumented migrant domestic workers are one of the worst casualties of this COVID-19. Many domestic workers are trapped in private homes, forced to work and paid very long hours and exposed to the deadly virus with no protective materials such as masks and gloves. Many are threatened to be terminated if they are there to step out the house during the lockdown and forced to work and pay during the days off. Their salary has been cut despite working extra long hours. There are many migrant domestic workers have been terminated without pay, unable to claim their unpaid wages because of their undocumented status. And even fear to access medical help even they are ill for fear being arrested and deported. The passports of migrant domestic workers are stamped with no recourse to public funds. And the government for law scheme during this pandemic also excludes domestic workers, leaving many domestic workers face this destitution, powerless to fight, determination without notice and pay, forced to work long hours without pay and day offs. Please listen to the testimonies of my fellow domestic workers. For four years, I was paid nothing for work most days from 6 a.m. until 1 a.m and I slept in the laundry room. I escaped because I have family to support and I also need a life. But why escaping from an abusive employer is a crime? Why I am being arrested and threatened to be deported? My male employer would suddenly touch my waist down to my bottom. I push him away each time and would follow me around in the house, including in the toilet. I had phobia whenever he is near me because he always look at me and sit near me. I wasn't safe at all being alone with my male employer because I slept in the living room, so I had to run away. I did not want anything bad to happen to me, so I had to escape. I thought of my husband and my children. I knew I was doing the right thing to save myself from possible rape. I was referred to National Re Referral Mechanism Assessment. I was told my case was too weak, so I didn't pursue this NRM. It made me sad and even more frightened because I thought I would be protected in this country. What would make my case stronger was to wait until my male employer sexually abused me. To me, this was the, what they told me about trafficking. I needed to be raped first so I pass and get protection. This clearly shows the vulnerability and demonstrates the need for an effective escape route, which provides for rights, as was the case prior to 2012, where workers can remain visible with the status and with, with, and with means to challenge abusive and exploitative treatment. The voice of domestic workers, along with Kalaya and Unite the Union Anti-Slavery International and Trade Union Congress hosted by MP Jess Phillips are launching our parliamentary campaign on November 17 to why a UK committed to ending slavery needs to return to pre-2012 overseas domestic worker visa. We are calling for when a reversion to the overseas domestic worker visa that existed before 2012 that allowed domestic workers to change employers and renew the visa for an unlimited time, provided they were in full-time full employment as a domestic worker in private household. The criminal, two, the criminal offense for undocumented working in the Immigration Act 2016 to be repealed and employment rights separated from immigration status so workers can claim their employment rights regardless of status. 
Domestic work is central to human life. It is the beginning and end of all labor. Domestic workers provide services and private homes as catered to children, the elderly, the disabled, and general household chores that allows others to do their work. Domestic work is work, domestic workers are workers, and we should be protected by the same rights that all other workers have, even if we are migrants. Let us not sacrifice our humanity in quest of immigration control. Thank you for li listening. Thank you so much, Marissa. We really appreciate having you and speaking about lived experiences of people who are living in the UK who are undocumented. Um, so I'm going to go back to Mariemma, who's joining us um, from Italy um, on a call. Uh, she's working, so she's just fitting us in. So we really appreciate it. Um, so Mariemma is an activist from Movimento Migrante Nepali in Italy. Uh, and refugees uh, movement in Naples that started out of the frustrations of not feeling like there was a political representation for them with talks of regularization programs that were exclusionary to most undocumented migrants in Italy. Perhaps Mariemma can tell us a little bit more about where this all started and how the situation in Italy has evolved up to today as we have been following some of the developments from there. So passing it over to Mariemma Fay. Hi, hello everybody. Hello, I am Mariema from Movement of uh, Migrants and Refugees of Naples. Um, as you can imagine, we are working here in Naples for the rights of the migrants and the refugees. Uh, so the first thing I want to say, um, because um, Italian government and uh, also European governments usually don't do like, um, uh, like, like if for them it's like migrants and refugees are the same, but it's not like that because migrant is somebody that leaves his country for work condition or just for improve his life. Um, refugees are people that actually escape from something, so uh, their life is in danger. Our movement was born in Naples like around four years ago now uh, because we have like a center and uh, in, in, uh, in, this, in this structure arrived some people from Mali in Africa and, uh, um, and they, they were kicked kicked out from the structure uh, that we live in. So we decided to do what we call controllo popolare. That means uh, popular control. So we decided to control them instead of being controlled by them. So uh, we went inside the structure that guest migrants and uh, we find out that all the migrants rights were not respected. So we decided to like uh, create a movement and now in fact we are not just like um, assistance, legal assistance or that, but we are also a political movement. I say political movement because um, we do have like a legal team, uh, legal assistance, Italian school for migrants, but the real point and the goal of our structure is to build a movement, a political movement for the rights of everybody because the migrants live in a condition that the state is forcing them to live like that. We call them like they are invisible because in fact, uh, a lot of the work that Italian people don't want to do it anymore, migrants are doing it. And it's not just like about the poor migrants that is living in this country, it's about human respect, human, human life. During these years, we also fought against the law because in the past like three, uh, four years, a lot of law uh, were like, uh, it was like the migrants was the gold of the objection. As you know, in the south of Italy, especially, there is a lot of mafia, but in the past years, in the news, in the television, um, instead of speaking about mafia, about Camorra, they were speaking about migrants. So the rhetoric that was building is that migrants is equal to not security of the country. Uh, and with that, a lot of law go inside, like Salvini's law, 
mean need is low. See, from left and right, everything is always the same because all these laws are just for like um, reduce migrants, reduce migrants' rights. I don't know if there are some comments below because um, I cannot see it. I see sometimes just um, a few things coming out. And anyway, so uh, especially this year with coronavirus, the situation of migrants was uh, definitely catastrophic. In fact, during lockdown with the OPG, so PATS, and our movement, Movimento Migranti Refugiati Napoli, uh, we did like um, a mutual structure of our political movement. So we went near in the street during the lockdown, uh, bringing food to people. Uh, and we propose a big, important law here in Italy, because the first thing that migrant needs is the residence permit. Without resident permits, you cannot go to hospital, you cannot go to school, you cannot even have like a work contract, house contract, nothing. So you are invisible. So, um, and for Italian law, the, per the residence permit is connected with the work. If migrant does not work, they don't have residence permit. And in this period, in this crisis, economic crisis, sanitary crisis, it's very important to like leave this connection between residence permit and contract of job, because it's very, very important to give the opportunity of protecting themselves to everybody. So that's the point. And now the Italian government replied to that with a new law and is a law for give the residence permit just to the people that has working in three sectors. That is like uh, Badante, I don't know how to say that in English, Badante is like the people that is taking care of old people or people that work in the house or people that work in farm. This is just the three worker that can be uh, defined by this new law. That means that if you are a migrant and you are working, uh, without contract, so without like protection of your work and of your person, if you are like working in restaurant or working in everybody else that is not this three um, work, you cannot have residence permit with this new law. Now this new law is ended, so um, we are like we are fighting because there are a lot of migrants now that are living in the Italian state that has no. Um, like no rights, we can say that, because also the people that are asking for the asylum, uh, they like are receiving all the negative from tribunal, from court, from appeal. So the document condition right now in Italy, we are speaking about uh, uh, like um, 600, sorry if I don't say it correctly, 670,000 person without document and also their kids because their kids in Italy we don't have use solely that means that the people that are born from two immigrants parents they don't have resident they then they don't have citizens they don't have citizens until they are 18 uh, and I think we think as movement that this is not possible in a state of rights that in 2020, 2020, there are still people that are born here, grew up here and have no rights and have no citizens until they have 18. So uh, this is uh, our situation right now. We're fighting with our uh, legal assistance we are helping a lot a lot of people having the documents fighting the system uh, unfortunately we also had a lot of lost um, this summer like we lost three of our militants because they were working in farm malik cham died in farm because um, they live like in the ghetto and uh, uh, his house take fire so he died like that so as long as you have no rights, you are invisible in this country, that's what we are fighting. And uh, we are standing up for our rights, for our children's rights. And uh, because like we think that a community that take care of the rights of the last and of the poorest people is a community, is a community that take care of the rights of everybody. Well, um, I think I'm done. I don't know if there are any questions. Thank you so much to everybody. and. Uh, 
for inviting me here. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm open. I don't know how this is going to work right now. And I don't know, give me a feedback. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Munia. Thank you, uh, Marima. I think we'll take questions at the end. So if there's any questions and you have to go, we'll take the questions and we can send them to you and you can reply. So thank you so much for giving your time from Italy. Um, and thank you so much for speaking about the experiences and what's happening there. It's good to have like a more global understanding of what's going on. Grazie. So uh, next we're gonna have uh, Rogelio Braga. Rogelio is an activist campaigner who is seeking political asylum in the UK. He is a community organizer with the Canlingan Filipino Consortium, as well as the Status Now Network which regularize, as I mentioned, are also part of. And um, along with us and uh, other groups, our um, Kanlungan uh, Filipino Consortium are campaigning for status now for all. And that's for undoc all undocumented migrants and migrants in the legal process. So I pass it over to Rogelio. Thank you so much for talking. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sunita, and thank you very much for inviting us here. And um, again, my name is Rogelio, and I'm from uh, Kanlungan Filipino Consortium, and also for the Status Now. Now, to introduce our organization, let me begin first with Kanlungan Filipino Consortium. It's a migrants' rights charity based in Hackney here in London. It is an organization composed of several member organizations, uh, mainly um, uh, Filipino organizations and those organizations catering the interests and rights of people from East and Southeast Asian uh, communities living in London. Now, um, um, Kandungan is a registered charity consisting of several organizations. And uh, I just want to um, introduce uh, the, the goal of the um, um, organization, uh, just also to give us a, a, a clear view of the situation of Filipino migrants living here in the UK. I'm not going to repeat what Marisa has uh, given to us because that is a very interesting and succinct uh, um, a description of the lives and struggles and challenges faced uh, by undocumented Filipinos living here in the UK. Number one, Kanlungan, um, um, actually our organization, um, aims at advancing education and training for Filipinos to enhance their welfare and improve their social conditions. Because as we have observed in Kanlungan, uh, Filipino migrants um, here in the UK, one of the things, uh, one of the things that happened is this killing. So um, in the Philippines, they are highly skilled uh, workers when they come to the UK uh, because of, of the migration status. Um, most of the cases is that uh, um, uh, Philippine, high-skilled Filipino workers become the skilled um, uh, here in the UK. And also we promote the economic welfare and help alleviate the hardship and distress among Filipinos. Um, because of the migration um, um, status of some of the Filipinos living here, uh, 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 documented and those with irregular migration, they all usually end up in destitution. As we have observed in Kanlungan, especially at the beginning of the lockdown last March, most of our undocumented uh, uh, members of our communities were actually displaced from their works. Um, uh, they ended up in destitution. So our organization is trying our best um, uh, at, at least to help these uh, Filipinos, uh, members of our organization. Number three is to raise awareness of Filipino social, economic, political, and cultural conditions within the Philippines, which engender forced migration in the United Kingdom in Europe. Just for the benefit and of, of everyone, the Philippines has a standing labor export policy, um, uh, which is a very oppressive and uh, 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 policy since the 1970s that workers actually are being exported. Uh, Filipinos are being exported abroad as workers working in dangerous, demeaning, and um, and 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 undignified jobs. And lastly, Kanlungan also, uh, uh, we, we want to build solidarity uh, with migrant organizations of other nationalities and peoples that have similar um, aims and objective. Kanlungan is part of Status Now. I think um, um, Sun Sunita mentioned about Status Now. Status Now is a coalition of almost 80 migrants and rights organizations, labor unions, and community interest groups in the UK and Ireland asking for the uh, 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 government of the United Kingdom to regularize all undocumented and migrants and those who are 
uh, uh, in the legal process because of the COVID, because of our public health reasons. Now, um, um, can Lungan together with the status now, aside from we are asking for uh, the regularization of all undocumented migrants um, uh, living in the United Kingdom, we are also calling to end the hostile environment policies um, here in the UK. Um, uh, we've been talking about hostile environment policy. I think one of the best description of hostile environment policy is from the free movement. And I'll quote, uh, the hostile environment policy includes measures to limit access to work, housing, healthcare, bank accounts, and more. It is characterized by a system of citizen on citizen immigration checks. The majority of these uh, proposals became the law via the Immigration Act of 2014 and have been uh, tightened and expanded under the Immigration Act of 2014. Uh, uh, 16 and code now um uh, hostile environment policy from the mouths of uh, from the mouth of theresa may in 2012 aims to create here in britain to quote theresa may a really hostile environment for illegal uh, uh migration now the previous speakers actually explored the concept of the legality uh, the legality of illegality of migration now um uh, a hostile environment policy uh, uh, of the United Kingdom impacts the lives of Filipinos, documented and undocumented. It it it, it actually uh, uh, impacts our, our access to rent, access to uh, uh, opening a bank account, access to employment, and uh, even in creating a humane and and a, a human relationship, actually, and legalizing and, and access to legalize. Um, uh, uh, channels for migrations. So, like for example, because of the luxurious amount of 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 uh, uh, of applying for a visa or the requirements of 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 renewing a visa, most people, most Filipinos who came here as a documented migrants ended up as undocumented. And we are sure in Kanlungan that this thing happens only not to Filipino communities, but across all migrant communities here in the United Kingdom. Undocumented Filipino migrants living here in the UK contributes to British society. Uh, we are working as nannies, carers, um, um, cleaners. Some of us, are, are the documented working as nurses and teachers. And we would like to ask the government of the United Kingdom uh, to, to, to uh, uh, provide regularization to all undocumented migrants. What we are calling um, uh, in Can Can Lungan in the status now is to stop criminalizing migration and migrants in this country, to stop and end the racist hostile environment policy of the United Kingdom standing since 2012. We are asking for regularization for all undocumented migrants in the United Kingdom. And we are encouraging everyone to join um, a status now. Uh, we send an open letter to the uh, prime minister in March. Until now, we haven't received any response. We tabled an early day motion and we are being supported supported by almost 40 um, uh, uh, um, um, members of the parliament right now. And we're calling everyone uh, to join the status now, uh, a solidarity uh, to, uh, to ask the British government to provide regularization to all undocumented migrants and to end the racist hostile environment uh, po policy against migrants. And uh, in solidarity with everyone, we have to make the hostile environment policy failure, a failure at all times and at all costs. And thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you so much, uh, Relio. Thank you for speaking um, so um, well and speaking about how the hostile environment affects like ordinary lives. Um, and your experiences of like what happens in the Kanlungan Filipino Consortium. Um, so the next speaker is Marga Rebeladio. Sorry if I said that wrong, Rebeladio. Marga is an activist with Apoyo Comunitario Sir de Londres, COVID-19 traductores. Sorry, my Portuguese isn't very good. A community group of activists working to support the Latinx, Spanish speaking and Portuguese speaking communities in South London. It was established to face the hardships that came as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and crisis. So I'll pass it over to Margot. Thank you for being here.
Thank you, Sunita, and thank you for the effort of pronouncing the name. I know it can be a bit difficult. It feels a bit harrowing to, to present after it, Rogelio. That was very intense, and all of the panelists were amazing. Um, so, Apoyo Comunitario Sur de Londres is a relatively new group that emerged or was created at the beginning of the COVID crisis. Um, we started organizing to support the Latin American community. Um, at the beginning of the crisis, as we knew that different local mutual aid groups were uh, being organized, but a lot of people that needed access to those local aid uh, groups uh, didn't have the language skills to access them. So it was initially set up as a translators group of, we will put you in touch with your local aid group um, so you can access the support that the community can, can offer you. Um, we started like that, but as we started getting requests, we started realizing the level of need that was evident as masses of people were losing their jobs and had no access for the support that the government was putting there for everybody else, but not whoever wasn't British or didn't have a secure migration status. To clarify a little bit, the, La the Latinx community in the UK, it's a mixture of people who, um, who have access to public funds. Many of them do not know how to access them, but they are entitled to them. Uh, also people who are in the process of seeking asylum and also people who are within secure st status. Uh, and that on top of the barriers that the system has in place, also have the barrier of language. Um, so at, at around April, um, a few people realized, okay, well, the, the level of need is massive and nobody's supporting our community. And all of the charities that are there meant to be supporting the communities are like absolutely falling in tatters because they are not open or, or they are very open with very limited services. So we started working out a clear, a clear protocol of referrals for those that did have access to uh, public funds, but didn't know how to access them to coordinate with other groups and volunteers for food access because food security was a massive issue for like all groups and we all know that during uh, the first few months and it still is um, during the first few months of COVID and then we put up a fundraising for emergencies support funds for people who had no recourse to public funds mostly but also anybody from the community that got in touch with us and was like I need I cannot uh, buy food at the moment and I can cannot access any support around me. This was an ongoing process. We have been um, trying to fundraise money constantly and requesting people to donate and that has been quite successful. So we've been able to financially support some people. We've been able also to support other people following, um, trying to get them to access support that is existing, but sometimes the system just doesn't want to work. And we also have been working uh, on translating um, for people in order to access those services from like food banks to um, calling the Red Cross uh, in order to access for their financial fund that they put for emergency, like for emergency situations, or even to call their GP because they weren't sure about their health. They didn't know whether they could go to the doctor. They didn't know whether they were going to get charged or not. They didn't know like, and, and they were just scared and no, of the information that the government has been putting during the COVID crisis has been in other language but English. Um, so that was the, the initial setup of Apoyo Comunitario. Um, then uh, we've started collaborating or seeking support with other groups, especially with food banks to establish uh, straight, like direct ways of um, opening their doors for people who have no recourse to public funds because what we found out as volunteers, we were all volunteers and some of us had different experience in different areas, but we, what we weren't very sure of is how each different food bank works very differently in different boroughs and how people in different areas of London and also outside of London were facing different questions, uh, need for documentation, different no lack, lack of, of translation. So it was coming up with ideas of how does all this work? And we started also thinking, well, we're putting all this work here and we're supporting all these people who are saying, actually, thank you for this help. We also want to do something about it, but we just don't know who to team up with. So we've started thinking about what the best ways of campaigning 
are and linking up with other groups and how to use our very limited resources of time and and funds to try to bring um, the people that have contacted the group for support and bring their ideas on what the best way of campaigning for what they want is. Um, we have faced a few different barriers when trying to um, support people on their route to access the support that they are entitled to or trying to um, access funds, for example, the Red Cross funds for no recourse to public funds. Um, one of them is the constant lack of uh, interpretation that public services are meant to, to provide by law and they just constantly don't. Um, and also is the unnecessary immigration checks that organizations or bodies like the Citizens Advice Bureau continuously do uh, on services that are meant to be for everybody and that just work as a deterrent for um, people trying to go and access that fund, for example, that, that one comes to mind because we have been dealing with that very recently, uh, of something that uh, during June and July, we would get in touch with the Red Cross, we would do a referral, we would be talking with this person and be like, okay, are you happy to give this information or not? And the Red Cross would be very happy to just be like, we're going to give you this financial support for this amount of time. Um, and now all of this is being done by uh, the Citizens Advice Bureau, which can be very intrusive in what they're asking and seem to like some of the people that work there doesn't, don't seem to be aware that this is actually pushing people away from seeking support that is there. But it's a scary because in the current system and in the current climate, if somebody's asking you about your migration status and you know it's insecure, you're not going to go back to ask them. Um, at the moment, we have been seeking different kinds of financial support in order to continue supporting families uh, that are and, and individuals who are no, rec no recourse to public funds and um, who we have not stopped supporting because there is no other uh, source of, of support for them. We have also been uh, doing um, referrals and trying to help in different ways because each case that comes to us and each person that comes for support needs a different thing. Uh, we are not a blanket group and different people have different needs. Uh, but we are also trying to, we're, we're about to start a process of consultation with um, everyone that we've been supported, supporting since May or a April, May, uh, and see who's interested in a kind of project that we, we've got thought with like enough structured spaces in which we can bring those voices in uh, but we need people and we need some help for this because we all started doing this um, when a lot of people had either lost their job or oh sorry either lost their job or they uh, had put, been put on furlough some of the volunteers that helped with this and suddenly we have a lot of things to do and not enough people that speak two languages that speak Spanish, English, or, Span or Portuguese and English. So if you are interested in helping with the Latin American community and with this, please get in touch. And I think that's my presentation for, uh, for now. It's, we've got a lot of exciting work ahead in very tough times, but thank you for inviting us to speak. Thank you so much, Marga. Um, yeah, we'll say so, uh, we'll share like so people's social media at the end, so people can uh, keep up to date and get involved with different organisations. Okay, so um, now we're going to go to the question and answer. We're running a little bit late, like maybe like ten minutes late, so we might extend the Q and A if there's a few questions. Um, so I'm going to ask if people. Uh, I'm going to unmute people, and if they want to speak, they can. Um, otherwise, I'll ask the question. So the first question is from East and Southeast Asian Studies, um, and it's about um, the number of trafficked people in Scotland. So I'm going to unmute you so that you can ask the question. Bear with me a second. So there you go. You should be able to speak now. And it, uh, they're based in Scotland. Hmm. Do you want to unmute yourself? Oh, okay, I'm just gonna read it out, I think. So 
ESAS are particularly concerned about the number of trafficked people into Scotland for the purpose of modern day slavery. Um, so is anyone, so I'm gonna open it to the panel and whoever wants to speak, um, please share. Can I pass it over to Bridget to speak about it? Hi. Hi. Um, you can ask me to speak, but I'm not sure I can say anything <laughs> particularly sensible because I don't know. Um, I don't know about the numbers of people trafficked. I suppose, you know, I know this is perhaps a contentious thing to say, but I'll put it out there is that I think that um, I think that we have to think carefully about when it is useful to use the trafficking and modern slavery framework and when it isn't. Um, and uh, that obviously there is sometimes when using the national referral mechanism, for instance, is really more or less the only way that people can get access to um, stay and to uh, basic services. So um, of course that is the case and, and people have to use whatever they have to hand in order, you know, in order to survive and in order to be able to build a case. Um, I think there is a challenge in that, um, when does exploitation become so extreme it counts as trafficking? Um, and I think we need to beware of kind of differences and distinctions that can be built in, like sorts of hierarchies of, um, you know, hierarchies of problems. Many people are undocumented workers and exploited and not trafficked. And, um, you know, as you say, said at the outset, Anita, you know, we don't want to have hierarchies of deservingness and who gets to have what. Um, so that would be my kind of, um, not particularly factual or health, perhaps not very helpful um, comment. Thank you, Bridget, I appreciate it. Um, so the next one we'll go to is from Art in Time. Uh, questionable credibility, but on Twitter, the right wing are threatening the government if it grants amnesty for undocumented who have been here for more than a decade, as Boris has been the main driving force behind this. In order for this motion to succeed, the Middle England needs convincing of the benefits of introducing an amnesty. What do you think will be the best shot of doing so? Do you believe something good for undocumented will happen after December 31st as we leave the EU transition period? And before I pass it over to any of the panelists, I just want to say, um, so we don't use the word amnesty in regular eyes. It, um, it kind of conjures up this idea that there's, it, it go, feeds into the idea of like worthy and unworthy. So amnesty suggests some sort of wrongdoing. So we um, are very much firmly believe in talking about granting leave to remain. So we try to avoid that language just as a point. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Rahelio first, if that's okay, um, to answer. And um, I think I would like to, uh, uh, okay, sorry. Okay, I think uh, I would like to uh, begin answering that question by uh, affirming the importance of, um, of solidarity. So um, uh, of course we have, it is a duty of each, every one of us to educate. For example, we, I always believe in that. We educate those people um, who are actually watching uh, news, uh, 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 fake news or, over, uh, 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 or, or news that were fabricated uh, just to demonize the migrant. But what is important for us, I guess, is, uh, is solidarity. And when we mean solidarity is that we have to mobilize people from the ground up um, uh, to stand for our call for regularization of all undocumented migrants and those who are in the legal process. And I think um, um, uh, by, by, by mobilizing people by organizing ourselves, it's very important also, is that we may be able to um, expand our network and then hopefully continuously pressuring the government to change its policies um, um, 
uh, uh, with regards to undocumented migrants. Uh, just to share with you, like for example, last night, this is a uh, um, there was a tweet from a tweet from the Home Office account at, at on Twitter. Um, actually, the tweet is um, is conflating um, uh, um, uh, foreigners with. Uh, criminals, basically, I'm sorry, I cannot find, uh, with people who are seeking um, asylum here in this country. So as we can see, even the uh, government agency that handles um, uh, 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 asylum cases are actually looking at uh, uh, asylum seekers as criminals. So uh, I think having said that, um, it, it only shows to us that we have a lot of work to do. Um, we have to organize, um, uh, uh, we have to uh, continuously engage our community um, on, 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 on our agenda, which is really um, uh, to provide regularization to all the undocumented migrants and stop, uh, stop the, the, the hostile environment policy of, of, of the UK government. Thank you, um, Rahelio, for speaking about that. I think that's really important that, um, yeah, that tweet um, was shared amongst us yesterday in our Status Now group, and we all were shocked. I mean, it, it's become really common for the uh, the government to speak about, uh, you know, activist lawyers and things that are commonplace in the immigration system as being something extreme and unworthy, and it's hugely problematic. Um, so our next question is, does anyone else want, if anyone wants to speak on that question, can you just, yeah, Bridget, okay, go for it. Hi, thanks. Just to add to what Rahelia said, um, I think in terms of thinking about, you know, how to get people outside our movement, um, feeling that, um, understanding that they have something to gain from um, regularization. And so I think it's a really important question. Um, and I would just sort of also put two other thoughts out. Um, so the first is that um, actually it's a way of uh, ensuring stronger um, uh, labor conditions and labor rights for everyone. That actually, if you force people into situations where they are dependent on employers and can't report poor employment practices, that's not just bad for them, it's actually bad for everyone. Uh, and also that um, what we see is that not only um, with uh, undocumented migrants, but also with the treatment of migrants more generally, that very often um, it's like migrants are the canary in the cage, that actually uh, um, governments will try out things on migrants, allow the principle to come. So we saw that with, um, you know, with the Asia card, um, and we saw that with, uh, yeah, with which now, you know, some people when they're looking for emergency benefits, they also have to have cards. So those citizens as well as migrants. So I think that, um, you know, very often migrants are the people that are experimented on where principles of uh, oppressive government are used because people think, oh, well, that won't happen to me. And that won't happen to citizens. It's that's something completely separate. Actually, that's not the case. So there's uh, something that I think that citizens have to beware when they see migrants' rights being eroded is that in the end, their rights also will be eroded. Thank you, Bridget. I think that's really important to clarify, like thinking about how our rights are intertwined with migrants' rights and the most vulnerable in society. Um, so the next question I'm going to go to is, um, Marissa Begonia has asked the question. So it often feels like new groups of activists start their work by setting up entirely new organizations rather than seeking to build on what is already there. Can panelists comment on the processes they go through to avoid duplicating the work of established groups? Um, can I give that to uh, Rahelio? Okay. Thank you very much, um, 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 Sunita, and thank you very much for the question, uh, Marisa. Um, uh, I think like, for example, with my experience with uh, Kandungan Filipino Consortium, because Kandungan is, uh, is, a, is an organization with member organizations of several Filipino 
um, um, or organizations and interest groups. I think um, like for example, um, um, like for example, we have an organization, a member organization called uh, Filipino Domestic Workers Association, FTWA. And aside from um, um, helping um, real time uh, Filipinas, like for example, victims of human trafficking, um, the goal of the organization is also to, um, to address the root of migration of, of, of Filipinos basically. And this is what we call uh, 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 also the forced migration and the labor export uh, policy of, of, of the Philippines. So um, um, it, it depends because there is an organization like for example, also addresses a certain concern, but it goes beyond. Uh, so that's why um, uh, the campaign, for example, of FDWA, Filipino Domestic Workers, aside from also calling for a regularization or this, are improving the, the, the situation of, of, of migrant workers here uh, in the UK is also to address the problem of what's going on in the Philippines. Uh, because the problem of migration as far as, for example, Filipinos are concerned, this is actually structural. So we uh, 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 organizations have to address the push and the pull back factor of the migration. I am not really sure with, uh, with other communities, migrant communities in the United Kingdom on how they um, um, I like, for example, address or or or, or look at um, these kinds of, of social movements where there are new groups or activists um, um, actually uh, uh, building organizations instead of 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 joining another uh, existing organizations. Thanks, Oji. Um, I also want to pass it over to Marga, who wants to discuss about this. And also, this question was actually from Don Flynn, but. Just, yeah, I think there was an issue around his login. So yeah, I'll pass it over to Margot to spill, speak about this. Um, yeah, sorry, is my video on? I was being asked to put my, uh, okay. Um, I just wanted to say that it's, it's really important that we try not to duplicate work, but also there, there are areas in which there just isn't enough people working on. So as much we're, as we're not trying to duplicate work, the organizations that are doing certain amounts of work just can't reach because they, there isn't just enough resources. So we need more people on the ground doing this work. And eventually it'd be great to like uh, team together and see like some, some groups are grassroots uh, collective, some others are more set up organizations. What they can do is also very differently because a charity in this country that receives, uh, that works with the community, with the Latin American community to put an example and receives a, uh, uh, Look, uh, funding from the local council can say and do very different things from a grassroots collective that is not replying to any uh, local, local council and therefore is much freer to try things that may be a little bit more unorthodox but much more clear in what we need. Because uh, unfortunately a lot of organizations because of the way of, of the funding structure uh, are tied into saying things either in a very, very sort of low key between the line ways or just smile and nod and try to do very valuable work but not be, be able to, to actually confront those local authorities or the, the, or the government in the same way. That's my bit. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll pass it over to Bridget to speak about this. Yeah, just really quickly, um, and it's a bit, uh, now I know the questions from Dawn, it's a bit like teaching my grandmother to suck eggs, but I do also think it's worth saying that there is a history to, that sometimes there's also a risk that we forget our histories, um, and that actually we could do with um, knowing, perhaps sometimes recovering and knowing those histories a bit better, and I'm thinking particularly, um, you know, if thinking back to the uh, anti-deportation work of the kind of early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, and how anti-deportation work was very, very um, much implicated in anti-racism. That actually at that time, I would say that the migrant movement and the anti-racist movement were really um, uh, like, like, like this. And I think that it would be good to remember that and to think about some of the lessons that we can perhaps recover from those histories by talking to people like Don. Thank you, Bridget. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think 
um, as regularized, just as a point, I think we've really struggled to um, get things moving. But I think being part of the Status Now Network has really helped um, events like doing protests, things like this have helped us bring together different groups together. But I think we have spent a lot of time um, and effort trying to um, like cultivate those relationships. Um, sometimes it does feel like we're just reinventing the wheel again. Um, so yeah, I think we do need to make more effort to like work together. But like, as I know, like Oji really well from um, S SNN and other groups here, it has, it has paid off. So I think, yeah, we do need to learn from each other and like work together a bit better. Um, I've got ne the next question, which is, um, from Anonymous, so who knows. Um, are there any lessons we can learn from the developments in Italy? We have seen the Italian government recently implemented a regularization scheme during this pandemic, which was initially lauded by the centre and some left-wing press in Europe as progressive. But it ended up excluding most undocumented migrants as it was limited to just a few agricultural workers. Are people happy about it there? And that's for Mariema. Uh, yeah, hi, hello again. I'm not sure I, I, I understand the question. Can you repeat it for me, please? Yeah, so it's asking whether there was a regularization scheme put in place in Italy, um, but it excluded quite a few groups. Yeah. So just what was the opinion of people there? Like, how did they feel about it? Was it mostly come as a positive, negative, or just a symbolic thing more than anything? Uh, when you say people, you mean the Italian people or the migrants? The, I think both would be good to know. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> um, it depends because, um, <coughs> like, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, there are like three different like opinion. Okay, because we have like the migrants, Italy, Italian people, and also like the. Um, uh, and also the government, okay? Because as I was saying before, it was it, it's, there is like a, a war between right government and left um, politic, okay? But uh, the point is that together they are doing like laws against the migrants. So this sanatoria after the coronavirus things was exactly for just a group of worker of migrant workers, but what's the point? The point is that it's like a fake sanatoria. When I say sanatoria, is this new law that just for two months they uh, permit people to have like residence permit. It was like a fake sanatoria because um, it, it's like they are they are doing division between citizens. It's like uh, Italian against migrants. And it also, it's also like white people against black people. But the point is not like, of course, about, that's why I also want to reply about um, the people that have spoken before me, because it's not just about um, anti-racism, because it's, it's um, a status, it's a status. So it's like migrants has to be blue. Black people has to be blue, but not just black people, because of course it's poor black people. So that's why the gold is the migrants, because they are the poor black people that are living in the country. So everything is through the cliche. So for the Italian people, and I'm not speaking for all the Italian people, of course, but for the Italian people, it's like, okay, so you are black, you are migrants, you are not secure for the state, you should not have the documents because you will steal my job, because you will steal uh, my status here, because this is my country, you are not like, um, welcome here. Of course, it's not all the Italy because is I cannot say that like in Italy there is uh, Italian people are racist, but racism is still a strong um, base in Italy. And of course, we speak about um, racism not just because of the color of the skin, because that racism is just in in some few people. The problem is that the institutional racism. Okay, the racism that go through the laws, the racism that won the war through poor people, because after it's like Italian people versus black people or migrants people. But of course, it's 
everything is just a game of the capitalistic system which where we are living it because it's not like mm, this sanatoria was just um I, I don't know how to say that but um the burn of this sanatoria is also fake because can you imagine that after like three or four years of laws that didn't give the opportunity of migrants to have the residence permit, they need a law for giving residence permit. This is something very um, that, that, that show how controversial the situation is because this, the same state that like, is, is, is doing it's making people became invisible. After a while, they need these people because after coronavirus, nobody was working in farm. Nobody was working in the agri agricultural system. So they needed migrants. They need migrants. That's why they did a lot just for migrants, not all the worker, not all the migrants workers, but just the one they need. So that's the point. That's the point is rich people against poor people. People that like are living in this world as object, object and people that want to be the subject of the world and control them. That's why I don't know if maybe um, in Italy, just like a few weeks ago, happened the case of Willy. I don't know if you hear that. Willy, it was um, an Italian boy, 21 years old, but he was black. And in a fight, four big, big and I see masculine guys, they killed him. So probably Willie didn't die for racism, but probably he died for racism because this is like the, um, the thing that we have through the institutional racism. So it's like people, they are having problems and the government point that problem as the poorest of the people. And because we are living in a very, moment of crisis, that's the reason why the war between the poor people exists. I don't know if I explain myself better because my English is not perfect. So this is, we have to stand up through the organization, through the mobilization, through the strikes, because it's very important to show to the government that we are not alone and to show to the people that we are together as one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam. I think you did answer it um, uh, well. And I think, yeah, it's it's nice to hear the experiences of what's going on there. And I think we're, yeah, it does feel like it's very different, but we are kind of getting to the same stage in the UK as well. Okay, so I've got one last question, which is from Tim Malone for Professor Bridget Anderson. Is that every government, country or organisation can define migrants in any way that they choose to suit their own ideologies. Are there any internationally agreed definitions within the EU or UN? Would an agreed international definition help or hinder the plight of migrants globally? Uh, hi. Um, so there is actually uh, a definition that's used by the UN, um, which is called the Long-Term International Migrant, LTIM, um, which is basically a, um, a person who crosses an international border but leaves their usual country of residence and is planning to go and live in another country for more than 12 months. So that's actually the definition that is used generally when you see the kind of you know, 3.5% oh, of the world are international migrants. That's the definition that they're using. Um, it's a very, it's a problematic definition because um, obviously uh, um, it doesn't mention citizenship, for example. So if you were a British citizen and you were going, uh, you'd been living in Japan for 10 years and you were coming back to live in the UK, um, you would count as a migrant for the purposes of that definition. Um, it's interesting because it talks about time. I mean, there are lots of interesting things about it, but it's actually, that was also the definition that was used by the British government in, to get its net migrant, when it was pursuing its lamentable net migration policy that then proved to be such a disaster. Um, 
I don't, I think it's going to be impossible to pin down a meaning of a migrant, but I suppose, I think it's important that we're clear who we're talking about. We're clear about what we mean when we're using the term migrant. And I think it's also important to recognize that it's, um, to, to, what's the word, to, to, to actually kind of consciously demand respect for the term, because I think actually it is a stigmatized term. It is a term that is used um, uh, of people, as Marima was talking about, of people who are imagined as being poor, as people who are imagined as not having agency, who are imagined as having a being of no consequence. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that's part of what I think is fantastic about regularize and the work that's being done is a kind of reclaiming of this term and demanding, you know, we can reclaim it for ourselves, but I think also just putting it out there in the public eye that migrants are people who make demands and who are, and that these demands are justified and need to be listened to. Thank you so much, Bridget. Really appreciate your time and speaking about um, uh, what that's about. Um, so I think we're gonna we're gonna call it a day for now. Um, we really appreciate that you have given your time. I mean, it's a pandemic, but still, I realise that other people might be wanting to do other things. But this is a really, really important issue. Um, I'm just gonna share with you some. Um, I know that um, our moderator has been sharing in the chat box, but I'm just gonna share my screen with you so that you can just see some of the links for the organisations that have spoken today. So just bear with me a second. So I'd re I think it would be really appreciated by everyone who's spoken today and us if you're able to um, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter um, and Instagram where we have um, those social medias. Um, and if you want to get involved more, those are really great uh, contacts to have. Um, so this is for regular rise. Um, uh, Movimento Migrante Napoli and Voice of Domestic Workers. Um, well, also anyone who signed up for Eventbrite will send an email with these links, so you've got them. But if you want to make a note of any that are really important, you can do that now. Um, and this is for Kanlingan, um, Apuyo, Kumunitaru. I'm not going to say the rest. And the Status Now Network, which um, quite a lot of groups here are part of, and it's a really important network and that it's kind of semi-autonomous but we make some decisions about like collectively working together and calling on the government to ask the status now for all and as uh we've mentioned Bridget's got these amazing books so definitely either read them or buy them um I think I'm definitely gonna <laughs> look them up she's got also lots of videos online and she speaks really well about these issues. So if you can do that and support her, I think that would be really appreciated. So through Status Now Network, we have um, been contacting our um, MPs and we've been trying to get them to support the early day motion. So early day motions are ways to demonstrate support for a particular cause. And this particular early day motion is around granting leave to remain to all um, people all those that are not UK citizens, irrespective of nationality and immigration status. And this has come about because of what's been happening in the country during COVID and how we've seen the limitations and the impact of what happens when people don't have status. So we are really like trying to convince MPs, we've been emailing them as organizations, but also it's really important to email your MP just to let them know this is something that matters to you. Um, and Global Justice Rebellion have also been, as part of this weekend of action, have asked MPs to, they've called on MPs to, to say that solidarity knows no borders. Um, so there's a, so a template for that, um, which I think has been put in the chat box. But again, we will send these out to people who have attended the event through Eventbrite. Um, and last thing is, if you can, on Monday, this is really, really important. It's the 10th anniversary of Jimmy Mabenga's death. Um, there are face-to-face -face, um, vigils happening across the country. So if you um, have a look at Migrants Organise, you'll be able to see the events that are happening 
um, maybe in your location. But otherwise, if you're not able to make face to face events, there's online vigils that, that have been organized. So um, most of the people on this panel will probably be attending them and regularized will definitely be attending um, at least an online vigil. So it's really important. It doesn't it won't take much of your time, but it's really important. I think a lot of what we've been talking about has been around centering this discussion around individuals and remembering those that have unfortunately lost their lives as a result of hostile environment policies. So um, please don't forget. And um, yes, I hope we can see you at the next one. And thank you so much, all, all of you, for your time. And thank you, the panelists. And um, hopefully we'll do this in the next couple of months because this has been really enjoyable. So thank you.